This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded, what is today? On <laughs> November 15th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here at the Incubator in New York City, Carl Zimmer. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I invited Carl to come and take a tour and then said, let's do a, a little recording. What do yeah. you think of the Incubator? <laughs> it is one of a kind, yeah. I'm, I the last time I saw you, I came to your office up in Columbia and mm-hmm. you had literally turned a, a, a faculty office into a recording studio. I was, right. I was kind of stunned and you interviewed me across your desk mm-hmm. and I was like, this is exceptional, and now you've yes. got your your own studio. Like this is yeah, we remarkable. Uh, we, I I outgrew the space and decided to have a dedicated space here. And as I told you, I hope to have people helping me one day to do this. Right, so I think it's we found a niche, and um, I can bring science to a broader audience. You know, everyone has their own thing. You you write, and we do media. Yeah. You've done some podcasts, though, before. Of course, you've done a couple with us. You've done some on your own, right? Yep. Yep. I've dabbled in the podcasting world enough to respect uh, <laughs> how much work it is. I mean, I, I, I listen to your your uh, your variety of, of shows, and uh, yeah, and uh, it's I, I appreciate it very much. I think a conversation is a good way to learn. That's, that's I think, the, the goal of this. I, I realized early on that people talking, especially when they diverge and you know tell tell jokes or whatever, it's good. It's people like that, and we go to meetings and do this in front of meetings as well. I just came back from American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and we did a couple of podcasts. We did them out in the hallway, and people are walking around looking. I said, "What is this?" You know, because most meetings don't have podcasts yet. It's very interesting. Anyway, while you're visiting, I thought we could chat a little bit about COVID because the last time uh, you were on one of our programs was before the pandemic. And obviously, it's had a big impact on anybody who writes about science, right? Sure. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about your experiences. And the first thing I always ask everyone is, when when did you realize this was a big deal? Like, ah. it, it, probably not in December 2019, I would guess, because I didn't. <laughs> No, no, and and I I do remember um, being aware of it in in early January tw- uh, twenty twenty right. um, on Twitter actually like um, mm. you know some people I followed on Twitter um, uh, the Australian biologist named Ian Holmes he just had a link to you know just there seems to be something going on in China yeah. you know yeah, and yeah. and I I remember thinking like. Hmm. Something going on in China a pneumonia like disease like um, I've this rings a bell and I don't <laughs> like the sound of that bell, but you know, if it's just, you know, quote unquote, just SARS, um, then it's going to be terrible, but it's not going to be that thing that we were always kind of worried about. And, um, yeah, I think by the end of January, um, you know, I w- I'd be talking to colleagues and we were all kind of like, this looks really bad. And yeah. And then, and then in February, I remember my editor who used to, basically let me write about whatever I wanted in biology, you know, mm. global warming, Neanderthals, whatever. And he just said, like, I'm just writing about co- editing COVID from now on. Yeah. So if you have any non-COVID ideas, go talk to someone else. <laughs> and I said, it sounds like we're going to be write- writing a lot about COVID. And he's like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm on board. And so pretty much at the end of February 2020, I was writing almost exclusively about COVID until you know, summer 2022 when I started to mix things up a bit. So it's been intense. And now you're not just doing COVID any longer, right? Not just COVID, but still COVID and still writing about it in ways I thought that I didn't expect it to be still news in the way it is. Yeah. So I noticed that you also were part of this dashboard at the times where they had all the data. You were involved with that, right? Because I saw your name on it. So Mm -hmm. What did that involve? What did you have to do for that? Well, um, uh, the the Times had been working a lot on um, different ways of presenting data. 
mm-hmm. just across the board um, on, on all sorts of different desks. They were like, how can we... How can we present the news in these new ways? Because a lot of our news involves just huge amounts of data. And and how do people keep track of it? So there was a team of people who, um, you know, it turned out that like keeping track of how many, just how many COVID cases, for example, mm-hmm. was really hard. And so they set up a huge team just to keep track of daily cases and hospitalizations. And they were getting information from across the country. So I am on the science desk where writing a column there and... You know, I was doing a variety of things, and one of them was keeping track of the vaccine news, and I was mm. reporting on some of the vaccine news. And we would have meetings, and um, people would say, like, okay, wait, so there's this, so Johnson Johnson's doing a vaccine, right? And this company, Moderna, is doing it, right? And <laughs> Pfizer's doing one, right? And, like, even like in say April or May of 2020, like there was too much to keep track of. So I started keeping a spreadsheet, um, and I would just, I would just update it, mm-hmm. you know, just uh, and 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 then if it, people had questions, sometimes it'd be like, oh, Carl's got the spreadsheet. Go ask Carl. So eventually, I think my editor just said like, well, this is this could be a tracker. It's, you know, it's just a spreadsheet right now, but let's make it a tracker. In other words, let's team you up with Jonathan Corum, who was one of the graphics wizards at the Times, and let's just make this something that people can check in on. So basically we said, like, all right, we're going to keep track of every vaccine for COVID that goes into clinical trials. And I think at the time, by the time we launched it in June, I think there were like, I'm going to guess like 20, mm-hmm. you know, and it went well over a hundred, you know, over the next year or so. And yeah, and there was just a huge amount of tr- readership of it because people were just like desperate, like to know, like where, where, yeah. what's going on, what, where, where do we stand? Um, and uh, yeah, so it was an it was an interesting way to kind of ride through the news, sure. you know, a different way of presenting it. I mean, I was still writing articles about mm-hmm. milestones that people were reaching with the vaccines, but here was almost like a like a Wikipedia for COVID vaccines. Sure. Yeah, sure. And is it, to get the data for that, did you have to look at the literature as papers were published? Is that part of it? Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, you keep you keep track of the journals, the preprints. Um, I just I had a folder of of uh, you know websites, web pages that yeah, I would go yeah, to yeah. pretty much every day. You know, company sites, um, you know, esoteric kind of news sites, and the clinicaltrials.gov site. You know, and just see what was going on. And uh, eventually, like, I had to have people come and help me, and sure. it was just so much. So, uh, did you do work outside of the Times, or was it? Mostly New York Times. Yeah, it, it was. I it pretty much became just the Times. Before then, um, I was sort of balancing uh, writing for the New York Times with doing magazine thing pieces for like National Geographic or the Atlantic. But um, it was just too much. I mean, basically, like the time. I mean, we were, at, you know, the the science writers at the Times. We just suddenly like we knew what it was like to to be on a breaking news beat. You know, like some, I was sometimes filing like two or three stories a day. Like it was crazy mm. based on what had come before. So I just didn't have time to write for anybody else. The amount of publications were huge, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like, I mean, I mean, I have been a science writer for a long time. I mean, <laughs> about 30 years and, and, um, Nothing, nothing comes close to these past couple of years. Yeah, it's been an amazing deluge, and of course, the preprint area was exploded also, and it had its own challenges. Right? Sure, yeah. I mean, we, you know, uh, science writers were trying to figure out what should we should do with preprints before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and and you know, here here would the would be these things that scientists would put out in public. So you can't just ignore them, but on the other hand, you know, they don't have, they haven't gone through that peer review process yeah, for what yeah. it's worth. So what do you do? And, um, you know, I would actually talk to scientists about it um, and sort of ended up, you know, saying like, well, I think I need to do kind of a, uh, an improvised peer review for these, these mm-hmm. preprints. Like just before I write about it, just go to a bunch of people and say, what do you think? And, um, you know, just try to try to kind of 
guide my way that way. But uh, yeah, with COVID, it just all got accelerated. And, you know, some people would say like, oh, I can't believe you're writing about those preprints. It's it's <laughs> nonsense. But, you know, six months later, it would be in nature. And like we, you know, on the one hand, we didn't have time to wait for that yeah. gradual process of pre peer review. But on the other hand, you don't want to be like promoting some preprint that says, oh, you know, ivermectin is going to cure everything, yeah, yeah. you know? Or, so, or there's HIV in the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Exactly. Remember that preprint? <laughs> that would yeah. ne- was never published because it was wrong. Right. I think that's really hard to sort out. And it's worse in a pandemic because you need to tell people what's going on, but you have to be careful, right? Yep. Yep. And, and there's a lot of pressure to get the news out right away. Yeah. I noticed that myself that preprints really drove the news cycle uh, during this pandemic. A preprint would come out, it would get covered everywhere, yep. which I think before a pandemic, that would not happen as often. You'd wait till it's reviewed, right? Yeah. Other, I, I, I wrote about a few preprints, um, but, you know, they would have to be something where I, I saw it and I'm like, wow, like this yeah, is yeah, this is yeah. something. Or maybe it was connected to an article I was writing about where other things were being published in peer reviewed journals. And I'd say like, same results are coming out in a preprint, which has not yet been peer reviewed. So having followed the pandemic in great detail, what what are the, some of the things you think the U.S. did wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Where do we begin? Yeah, I mean, um, what strikes me about the things that the United States did wrong that were the things that they could have easily done right. That, that's what that's what really is so striking. You know, we we certainly could have had the stockpile of PPE that we were supposed to have when it started. Mm -hmm. Like we had actually, this was actually something we were supposedly doing and we didn't, we did a very poor job of it. So we were not ready out of the gate. Um, And the whole thing with early testing is just still remarkable to think back to. It's almost like a, like a bad dream. Like, you know, it's just, you know, it's PCR. Like, how is this possible? Again, yeah. and, and, and how is, is the government, like, actually telling people to stop, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think early things like that are, were really quite striking. Um, you know, uh, you know the, the vac- certainly the vaccine part of the story was historical, like, yeah. just in terms of the timing of it. But, um, but uh, you know, I sort of... I feel like at this point we're kind of going into another mistake in the sense of like everything's kind of like shifting back so to kind of the pace that things have gone at before. So, mm-hmm. you know, when will we see a really innovative um, second generation COVID vaccine? I, 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 we're going back to that valley of death, as I call it, I think. And it's really concerning. I think there's a push to get out quickly, right? Something that would protect. And they've done a good job. But now if you want next generation, they're going to take more time to get beyond what we have already. Well, that's true, except that um, these groups have been doing kind of all they can do Mm. kind of on their own in these, you know, these small, relatively small undertakings. They've designed the vaccines. They have tested them in cells. They have tested them in animals. And now what? Like, a lot of them are just sort of spinning their wheels. <coughs> Excuse me. I think part of the problem with vaccines is that we're not sure what we need next, right? We probably could use something that covers any future variant, but we're we're not sure how to do that, and that has to get developed. But I think you would agree that the, the vaccine rollout was amazing, right? You said it was historic, right? Well, I mean, if you just look at, at, at um, the, the typical time it takes to introduce a vaccine, it's over 10 years. I mean, and yeah. and I believe that the previous record holder, I think it was for months maybe, was for like for four years in the 60s. Mm-hmm. But so that was the record. And, you know, th- this was under a year for, for COVID. And that was not just, and, and it was a, you know, no one had ever done a COVID, a uh, coronavirus vaccine before mm-hmm. for humans. And, you know, the ones that came out of the gate first were, totally um, innovative, you know, mRNA vaccines um, and then adenovirus vaccines too. Like, I mean, just like, like, so the, yes, I, I mean, certainly that, that all, that part of the story was, was quite, was quite remarkable. I mean, of course, getting the vaccines to people was 
a big mess as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. uh, and this <clears throat> remains a mess. You know, we're just, we, we apparently do not know how to deal with the global pathogen on a global scale when it comes to vaccines. And yeah, there are many countries who still don't have enough people vaccinated, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the last I saw, I think about 65% of the world is fully vaccinated. Yeah. That's it. No, oh, I think this is an area we could do better at, more vaccine equity, right? But we, sure. we still are vaccinating ourselves preferentially, right? Boosters left and right and not really worrying about other countries. Yes. And at the same time, the Pfizer vaccine is the most uh, lucrative drug yeah. in history. <laughs> yes. Making a lot of money, that's for sure. It's their time. Um, so what's your take on the current vaccine situation? So, you know, as vaccines were rolled out, suddenly we saw variants emerging that were resistant to neutralization with the antibodies made by the vaccine. And so now we have a Omicron-specific booster. What is your, you you've must be, you must have been covering this. What, what do you see going forward? Do you think this is going to be like influenza where we have a, a new vaccine every year, or will this be different? You think? I I think that I think that we we have been. It's been interesting how we have wanted so much to use influenza as our guide to COVID, yeah. and I think it's let us down so many times. Like Omicron, for example, there's no equivalent to Omicron in 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 our seasonal flu experience. Right. You know, the closest would be like a, a totally, a totally new pandemic yeah. strain or something. Yeah. But this isn't even a, this isn't something that spilled a new thing that spilled over from birds uh, from another animal. Like Omicron is just human COVID probably got inside somebody for a while and then, you know, gained a bunch of mutations and popped out and it was like something amazing and scary. But, um, like I, I, I mean, the thing is, like, I'm really, you know, one of the things before the pandemic, I, you know, evolution was just something I loved writing about. And even when I was writing about viruses, I would be really interested in writing about the evolution of viruses. And so here was COVID. And so one of the things I really wanted to do was to to talk with evolutionary biologists and say, like, you know, what's going to mm-hmm. happen? What should we expect? And I literally had people saying, like, ah, well, you know... <laughs> Probably like it's going to mutate, you know, you'll get like maybe one mutation a month or one or two a month, something like that. And it's going to happen in a very steady rate. Like people told me this, like just they were fairly confident, as confident as you could be of anything. And um, and that held true pretty much. And then, you know, in December of, of um, uh, the, the December 2020, um, all of a sudden, like in Britain, people are like, whoa, 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 we have something new that has a whole bunch of mutations. And it's like, it's off the, it's off the, the trend line. And so I'd call people up and be like, Hey, wait a minute, what just <laughs> happened? They're like, well, okay, this is not what I had expected. And, you know, they could then look to other th- experiences like with, you know, where there had been a lot of evolution within a person to start to think about it. And then we, you know, we went through that till Omicron. And now what's weird is like, you know, we have all these Greek letters for these really radically new variants. We're almost a year with Omicron. There's been no pie. No, that's it's, right. It's no all pie. Omicron <laughs> all the time. Everything else is gone. It's just all, the children of Omicron swarming around out there. All these little Omicron subvariants. Yeah, I mean, if you ask someone what's going to happen, some people will tell you, oh, yeah, we'll have this or... But it's hard to predict evolution, right? I think that the evolutionary biologists I've talked to have been... S- they they recognize that they have been humbled by this this virus. So when I try to get them to say like, okay, now we have this Omicron swarm, what's going to happen next? They're like, uh, you know, like they really are are very tentative. But um, you know, I mean, I think I, you know we do have all of these new Omicron uh, variants, and they're all kind of gaining some of the same mutations, which is bad if you like want to use Evusheld or some monoclonal yeah. antibody, like those things are out of it. But um, you sort of seen these, these, these different variants that take over different countries, Singapore or France or what have you. You don't see like a huge surge in hospitalization, you know? Right. So I don't know. I mean, does that mean, I mean, I don't know how much how much faith you have in T cells? Like, is this is this the T cells are backing us up? Or? I think so. I, I, I think the T cells are. My view is you get infected, even if you've been vaccinated. You, 
your antibody levels are either low or they're not going to work because it's a variant. But, you know, you'll get a, a B cell memory response. It'll make more antibodies. And then eventually the, you'll get cells infected and the T cells can clear them. So I think in most cases, it depends on your health. If you're over 75, you're going to have a tough time if you're immunocompromised, obviously. But I think in most people, the T cells do protect you because the changes in the variants are largely not in the T cell recognizing epitope. So yeah, my feeling is that we could probably go on these vaccines uh, for quite a while. Um, I wanted to ask you, do, do people have trouble saying I don't know to you when you ask them questions or... Are they, are they okay with that usually? I, I tend to prefer to interview the people who are willing to say I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. If people are like incredibly over certain about things, I don't know. I, I mean, there are those people are out there. Um, you know, so and 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 then I do as best I can. I try to, I try to reflect that sort of you know, um, lack of perfect certainty, uh, in, in, in my reporting, like just to say like, well, this is what the, what this person thinks at this point based on this, but that could change, you know, yeah, and it's, yeah. you never want to hear that like in, in a pandemic. Sure, <laughs> um, sure, sure. so, um, you know, so certainly like I will see, you know, I'm, I will be sometimes covering the same news as other people are, on the pandemic and I'll look at their story and they're like, ah, like, you know, this variant <laughs> is going to like kill us all. And I'm like, well, we don't know that, you know? And then the flip side is, you know, with Omicron, people would say like, oh, uh, it's mild. So therefore we're fine. And I would say like, well, well, you know, it, it, well, that means is like there's a certain percentage of people might be hospitalized and that maybe that percentage is lower. But if you then raise the number of people who are getting infected, you're still going to swamp your hospitals. And that's what, how it turned out. I mean, Omicron was a disaster in terms of hospitalization and death and so yeah, on. No, it still kills a lot of people a day, 500 right. people a day in the U.S. And if you're vaccinated and immune, it's mild probably. But if you're not, it's not so mild. Yeah. So Daniel Griffin always is saying Omicron is not a mild. It's not a cold. It can yeah. kill you. Yeah, but people still think yep. it's, people still talk about it as mild. Yeah. Well, once something is out there, it's hard to change it, right? Yes. Yeah. And I don't want to be, <laughs> I try not to be a part of getting things out there that are impossible to pull back. Yeah. One of the things I th I think about the variants, you, you mentioned talking with people and asking them what's going to happen. We've never seen a coronavirus do variation before, do antigenic variation, mostly because we hadn't looked Hmm. And at the beginning of the pandemic, Jesse Bloom started looking in the common cold coronas and he said, hey, these things change. And so then all of a sudden, SARS-CoV-2 started changing. It's a really good example of how you shouldn't say something doesn't happen if you haven't looked especially for it. Yeah, and, and, it, and it also just sort of goes to show, I mean, people will sometimes, you know, it's, it, it can be hard to sort of justify basic research on something where you don't have like, tell me about what it's going to do for me today yeah, kind of sure. justification. So these coronavir coronavirologists, you know, ever since the 60s when they found them, like they were just always in the backwater. Yeah, and, sure. and even after SARS, I was just, it's kind of amazing to think about it, like that there just aren't that many experts yeah. on coronavirus to do that kind of research. Well, so that's why we're in this position, because after SARS-1, we should have started making antivirals. And some of these antivirals were around yeah. five years ago, right? remdesivir. So we should have been doing it, but nobody would invest in, in coronaviruses because, oh, look, SARS-1 went away. Well, the, the, the ur there was some urgency, it is true, when SARS happened. And so, you know, some of the work that led to Paxlovid started yeah, around Paxlovid. SARS. That's right. and, and there were people who said, like, let's make a vaccine for coronaviruses starting with yeah. SARS. And both, the, it's interesting, if you look at the history of those projects, they both went forward for a little while and then kind of stopped. stopped. You know, That's they right. put the drugs on the shelf and because people were saying like, well, you know, <laughs> we're, we're more worried about influenza. I mean, nothing against yeah, influenza. Yeah. yeah, but. Well, that's why yeah. I think, <clears throat> so, you know, if you depend on pharma, they're not going to work on it unless there's a disease, right? The, the NIH in this country won't fund you because they'll say it's not interesting. So now we see these nonprofits arising that are trying to fill in the gap, right? To bring vaccines and drugs to through a phase one where they could be then ready with an outbreak. I think that's a good 
uh, approach to taking It's a care. good idea, but um, let's, let's see how it actually works. I mean, yes. you know, I get lots of press releases from organizations like CEPI and, mm -hmm. you know, they're impressive, but, um, you know, how, how, you know, how long is it going to take them to start up clinical trials and to get them to anywhere where anybody, any regulator would, would even consider them? Well, I also wonder, and this is a question I was going to ask you at the end, but we can address it now. So when this is all said and done, will we have learned anything or in the next one in 50 years, are we going to be in the same position? <laughs> I I was sure in the middle of the pandemic that um, things were just going to shift profoundly mm. to a new way of doing science. Uh, and, you know, scientists I would talk to would say like, like, this is, you know, as terrible as the pandemic has been, it has shown us new ways of doing what we do. Um, you know, and, and there was like incredible amounts of collaboration, you know, people yeah, yeah. who used to be very, you know, very jealously um, sort of hiding their results, you know, like let's say you crystallized a coronavirus protein, mm. you know, in, in, in the old days, you would just not show it to anybody until you had your paper and you'd unveil it and that would help you get a job and all that. Mm. I mean, people were just posting the crystal structures just in a database, like here, go, 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 like t take it all. And, um, and that really did accelerate research. But, you know, you, you see, you, s I have to say like the, the practice of science, a lot of it is just kind of ratcheting back. Sure. Um, and, you know, people who, you know, there were a lot of people who like shifted from studying other stuff to studying COVID mm -hmm. and now they're all going back. You know, so virologists are like, well, you know, I've, I've been calling people up to get their thoughts on like the latest with COVID. And they're like, you know, I'm really, I'm really busy with HIV now, or, <laughs> you know, I'm setting up a lab for endoroviruses. Uh -huh. Like there, uh -huh. there's, so you're seeing, I, I, I'm concerned you're seeing the tide pull back and that, you know, where, where, do, where will that leave us? Scientists follow the money, right? They have to, that's how they get their labs working. You need money. The university is not going to provide it, I can tell you. <laughs> right. So, so you know, so there, you know, um, it, it would be, I mean, we are going to have another, you know, emerging virus yeah, in, the, sure. in the next decade. We will have something. And um, it would be, it would be heartbreaking if we're back to square one. Yeah. I think know? we're going to have a flu pandemic and we'll be able to deal with that because we can make a vaccine quickly. But if there's another coronavirus like this in 50 years, I think we will have forgotten. I'm very cynical about people. I think we'll go back, as you say, to business as And I'm before. surprised you're so sanguine about a, about a flu pandemic. Oh, we can make a flu vaccine in six months, right? We could probably do it faster now. So people are trying mRNA flu vaccines. And if they work, that's that a big. Be, that's a big F. We, it is a big we don't F. know if those flu vaccines will work totally with mRNA, agree. and it, yeah. you know, if, if if there's suddenly a pandemic, um, flu. I mean, ha, there is a certain, there is something uh, problematic about you know six months of a of a flu pandemic. Of course, you know, like imagine someone said in 1918, like just wait six months. Let's just get through these, you know, millions of yeah, deaths yeah, and we'll yeah. have a vaccine for you. Um, and then that has to be distributed and so on. Like, mm -hmm. um, which is why you would like, you know, in a, in a magical world, maybe to have more sort of universal vaccines. Sure. But, you know, I've been, I mean, the idea of a universal COVID vaccine is, is obviously not the first universal vaccine concept. I mean, I've been writing about work on universal flu vaccines for I think I started writing about them maybe 10 years ago, you know, and you're always sort of writing about it like, well, this, this basic research is really promising. This might lead to something. And I think right now we're into phase one or phase two trials now, yeah. 10 years later. And it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to do that. Many people are working on it. But for flu, we do have antivirals as well, right? And we can deploy those where we didn't have them at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, although we should have. You know, can you imagine if we had antivirals in China before it got going? 
Could have been a game changer, right? Could have been, yeah. That's yeah. That's interesting to think about. But um, you know, on the other hand, you do worry about resistance too, sure. like of course. administering those. And the other thing I wanted to ask you was this: this pandemic we saw. The I am not masking, I am not getting vaccinated sentiment at its height, right? <clears throat> and you must have thought about this. What, what what's the what, what's the reason for that? Many countries are happy to mask and get vaccinated, but the U.S. seems to be problematic. So, what's the basis for that? Do you have any idea? Um, you know, it is something that that is is interesting, and and it is something that I'm you know. I will probably be looking into more, but that will be something for, to talk to uh, psychologists mm. and social scientists about, um, because and, and political scientists too, because that that's really what it comes down to. I mean, you know, in the United States, in, you know, um, you know, masks have had kind of a long um, uh, checkered history. I mean, and so like if you look back at the flu, the 1918 flu. Um, some cities would mandate masks, some wouldn't. Yeah. People were really angry about having to wear masks. In other places, they they put them on and you know wore them all the time. Um, you know, so so I think that there is like a you know there are histories in different countries that can uh, help to explain this. But um, you know, but on the other hand, like you do sometimes hear sort of just so stories about it like oh well america is got this sort of um individualistic anti-authority streak in it but you know the fact is that like um there was a point i remember there was a point in the pandemic i guess last year where um if you were walking around here in new york like lots of people had masks on and if you went to london mm. or to paris like nobody had masks on so um so it you, you, it's not going to be a, a simple answer, yeah. I think. Um, the vaccination part of it, um, I, in a way, that's more concerning. But that also has, a, I think, I mean, I think that the anti-vaccine community was sort of ready to to, to pounce, having spent years, you know, fostering distrust in terms of vaccines and autism and other things. Mm. So they, I think, that was just a very um, just a just a massive disinformation campaign. It also became politicized, right? Masking and vaccinating. Some some politicians said, you don't have to mask, you don't have to vaccinate. That that really got me that you would play with people's health. Well, you know, I I think that um, you know, for some, you know, I th- Again, I'm not a political scientist, but it does seem like, you know, pe- politicians are kind of looking at which way yeah, sure. uh, the things were going and wanting to kind of go along with it in order to, you know, uh, win the next election. So I want to ask you <clears throat> if the pandemic is over. But first, I, I want you to tell me what what your definition of a pandemic is to be, because everybody seems to have a different definition. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have... Uh, you know, I, I certainly, as a journalist, don't come up with my own definitions. I certainly look for them, and I, I have been sort of struck by how um, unsatisfying mm-hmm. the official definitions are. Yeah. You know, they're they're not um, they're uh, what's the term? I guess under theorized. Like it's like I'm like, what is that? You know, like you know, is there a number here? Like, is there like a, <laughs> is there a percentage or like what? Give me something. But it's like oh, when people kind of. I guess a pandemic is over when it doesn't really feel like a, you know, a global threat, whatever mm. that means, okay. you know, and, and, um, I, I, um, it seems like, you know, people came up with, you know, the, um, my feeling, my feeling is that people came up with a definition of pandemic just as a tool in order to observe when something ha- new has begun, mm-hmm. you know, I don't, I don't think that they really kind of gave a lot of thought of saying, like, when do we say that a pandemic is over? Um, you know, the 1918 flu, like, I mean, that kept going and going and going. Yeah. And then it be, then it became seasonal, but mm-hmm. kind of hard. It would be very hard to draw a line. I mean, certainly like by 1925, you'd be like, yeah, there's, we're just, we get the flu every year now, but it's still H1N1. I think it's meant also for response purposes, right? WHO tells the world, we're in a pandemic, do your thing now, right? 
I think that's a part of it. Not necessarily that there's a def- defined number of cases or even w- how much it kills you. I'm not sure that. So, for example, <clears throat> right now there are billions of rhinovirus common colds, right? Yeah. Is that a pandemic? Nobody thinks about it, right? Maybe because you don't get very sick, but sometimes you have to stay home. So there is an economic impact. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I think part of what's difficult about saying when is the pandemic over is because we kind of have this uh, idea that, well, things were, things were fine before, then it gets really bad and then things go back to being fine. But the fact is that like, um, you know, with the way our healthcare systems runs, like things weren't fine before, you know, and we, we, you know, we actually kind of, you know, it's easy for us to normalize a pretty high level of death from various things that we might do a better job of controlling. Um, so, you know, is, is uh, you know, is, is malaria a pandemic? I mean, uh, you know, like malaria has been with us forever, so I guess not. But it still kills, I forget what the numbers are, at least half a million people a year. Yeah, yeah. So, a lot of people die, yeah. Across a lot of countries. So I, you know, it, it yeah. I, I think though, that, I mean, what, um, I understand why people are concerned about s- being too quick at saying the pandemic is over because they're concerned that the effort that we're putting into or ha- have been putting into uh, controlling COVID was, will somehow go away. Um, th- I think that you know, I think the I think the the real problem there is not the definition of a pandemic. The real problem is with our sort of underlying public health system. Mm. Like we 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 have the vaccines and the antivirals and the epidemiological know how to save lives from COVID. Um, and whether we call it a pandemic or not, we can we can use all those tools. But it's are we going to use them or not? Well, I've had conversations with Lori Garrett, and she said the problem is we don't have a plan. We don't have a public health plan in the U.S. We never did at the beginning of the pandemic. We still don't. And that, I, I think that's part of the problem, right? Sure. Are you are you feeling that things are getting the normal now, though, at least around here? How do you mean normal? <laughs> well, nobody's masking, or 10% or 20% of people are masking, right? Yeah, so like people are out and about. They're, yeah, we're sitting here. Here we are. Like, we, you went to a restaurant. Yep. Uh, the theaters are open. The sports or everything is. Schools are open, right? Yes, that's true. On the other hand, you know, I live in Connecticut, and I took the train in, and um, I wore my N95 mask on the train. I'm just like, you know, like, if if I'm in a you know a, a, in a large in a large group of people in a relatively unventilated place. Mm-hmm. Why not reduce my chances of having COVID? I've already had COVID and, and it wasn't fun. And, and so I don't want to get it again. I also don't want to get the flu. <laughs> so why yes. not? Flu, other respiratory illnesses, you could make the argument. That Absolutely. Maybe we're going to see more people just masking all the time in the, in the winter respiratory season. Yes. I mean, I, I, um, I, did you ever see the movie The Big Short? So, so that there's a movie about the 2008 financial collapse, mm-hmm. and Brad Pitt uh, plays this sort of uh, renegade genius investor, a real, real oddball who spent a lot of his time, you know, like in uh, in Hong Kong mm-hmm. or someplace, and he's going to help <clears throat> some some young investors sort of make their way through the financial crash, and so he's going to fly. He flies to New York to to visit them, and he has he's wearing a mask. Uh, just a re- regular respiratory mask. And that scene of him coming down this escalator in this airport is, you clearly suppose at the time you're like, oh, this guy's crazy. This guy's wacky. This guy is just out there on his own. <laughs> you know, it's such a, and, and you know, there were, you know, there, and you say, oh, well, he, he picked that up in, in, in Asia. Like people, it, you know, when I wear a mask on a train, people don't go like, ah, oh, at least you know, on the train I take. Yeah. No, they don't anymore. A lot of people wear masks. Sure. Yeah. But I don't, but you know, I, I think, I, I think that we could reduce transmission a lot more if there was a lot more masking in these big space, unventilated spaces. But you know, like there are lots of other things we could do. We could invest in better ventilation and, you know, UV light. We could, there are lots of things we could do. Um, and you know, if we only do things when someone says pandemic, then, Mm -hmm. 
that seems foolish. Well, for example, now, if you test positive, you should stay home or you should wear a mask, stay away from people, right? But if you test positive for flu, you're not going to do that. But maybe we should. Or test positive for any respiratory yeah. infection. Maybe we should reconsider how we're reacting to those, right? Sure, sure. But meanwhile, um, you know, the, the, the pressure is on. If people are, are testing positive, you know, you hear stories of, you know, workplace stories of people like, yeah, just come back in. Like, I, yeah. I don't want, I can't afford to have you out yeah. for five days, let alone 10 days. Yeah. So, so SARS-CoV-2 has become influenza, rhinovirus, every other respiratory infection where you go to work unless you're really, really feeling bad. Right. Right. And, you know, what is, I mean, what is, and, but what is going to be the long-term impact of, of, of people getting you know, infected over and over again. I mean, I, I, I don't know what you think of some of these recent studies that have been coming out, you know, um, looking at long people's long symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or like, you know, what happens when you get reinfected and these greater risks of a variety of conditions. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to tell how solid those studies are. Yeah, it's too are, soon, yeah. right? You don't know how long, mm -hmm. but I had an internist here, um, a few months ago, she's a New York City doctor. She listens to us, so she came to visit. And she said, every person who gets an infection has some kind of long-term consequence, as far as she can tell. Almost everyone. It's not just long COVID, it's long flu, it's long mm -hmm. hep C, long measles. Everything has a long-term consequence because your body gets trashed for a while. And it's just <laughs> a matter of how long it takes you to recover. And everyone's different. Right. And now we're paying attention, maybe in a way that we hadn't exactly. been before. Exactly. I think but, that's a big thing. You know, but yeah. in a way, but that doesn't, I don't, maybe, but, you know, it, it might be tempting to sort of minimize it and say like, no, oh, no, it's, no. it's just like, you know, we've been putting out, dealing with this forever. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Like, this is like a, a problem that we hadn't really appreciated before. No, I agree. I don't, I don't think it's meant to minimize. It's just to say, we're seeing it because there's so many cases and we're, we're looking at it very closely, but it's been around before. And how much of, you know, general morbidity in people is due to long flu or long something else? Maybe we'll, we'll learn. And, but more importantly, how do you treat it? Right. Yeah. We don't have, we don't have any ways of treating it. We have to figure out what's the, the basis for it. Is it certain cytokines that we keep producing? And if so, we have to get rid of them, which we can do. Right. But we don't know that yet. Right, and that seems like a, a, a kind of a nightmare problem f for scientific research. Like there are just two, so many degrees of freedom in that. Oh, yeah. to, and, and it's hard. And you're having to track people over huge amounts of time, and you know, like how you go into all that data and pluck out, like ah, it's, yeah, it's this cytokine hard. or this autoantibody. Like very I, hard. The data are very noisy because humans are outbred. Everybody's different. So when you look at a big population, you're going to get a wide scatter in the data and you're not quite sure because, you know, I owe something and you might do something uh, in someone else. So it's not easy. Yeah. But we have a tendency during this pandemic to say, here's the answer. We just published it. And it's not, you know, the, the uh, risks of long COVID have started at 50%. Now they're down to a couple percent mm -hmm. you know, as, as the methods get better. So I think you have to be really careful with that. Um, the, the, one of the last things I wanted to ask you was <laughs> the first weeks of this pandemic, people started saying it was either made in a lab or escaped in a lab, and this will not go away. To this day, you know, we have Jeff Sachs saying we have to investigate this. We have uh, a, a, a weird GOP document saying it came from a lab. What is this reason for all of this? You, have you thought about it? Well, I mean, I've, you know, certainly reported on, on, uh, some of this stuff. And, um, you know, I, I, I feel that, um, I think, I think there are a lot of, uh, factors at play. Um, and, you know, you know, part of it is, uh, that it's, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's hard to sort of, you know, to, you know, to prove the negative. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what would it take? <clears throat> To for people who uh, uh, think that you know the lab leak is this you know really viable explanation, what would it take for them to be convinced? Because you know the problem there is like well like you know if let's imagine that you know 
China opened up all its lab books, notebooks, and and somebody was able to go through them all. Like then they then they might say like, well, yeah, but they were hiding the ones that really matter. Mm. You know, um, you know. The, uh, so, and I think another issue is that. Um, uh, Th- that the the sort of the the natural history of viruses is kind of unfamiliar, I think. I mean, the fa- you know you, the fact is that you have so many coronaviruses just chugging around in rodents and in bats and crisscrossing species, and they're, and it turns out they're recombining like crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so you know you have a, you, you, the, some of the most recent research. Um, has indicated that you know there's been so much recombination and it happens at such a fast rate that um, if you were to try to look now for the ancestor of SARS-CoV-2 in bats three years after the pandemic, you started you won't be able to find it. That's right. It's gone. It's been all chopped up and mixed up. You know, it's this giant viral broth out there. So, um, so when you're trying to understand like how this thing could have arisen, like, you know, you really do need to like reckon seriously with things, pretty unfamiliar things like re- recombination. You know, even a lot of scientists don't really aren't, you know, really familiar with the details of it. So I think I think there are a lot of things that are going on. You know, and the, and the fact is that um, you know there, there's uh, and, and you know and on the other hand, like you know you you know certainly people can point to um, you know real uh, sort of you know uh, lab or, or uh, you know accidents. You know they do happen, um, and um, so you know you sort of add that all together, and you get this situation that is yeah it's it's quite surprising that it's still is just chugging along the way it is. You may remember that when HIV came out, th- these theories started yes. as well. They said it was made in the U.S. government lab, and mm-hmm. only till they found the ancestor in Cameroon did it stop. And for the reasons you just pointed out, I don't think we'll find the SARS-CoV-2 ancestor. It's changing too quickly. Yeah, I mean, in a way, like the ancestor is like all over the place. It's uh, it's, yeah. it's 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 all Hard. it's it's fragments of viruses that are in bats flying all over the skies in in China. And I think also Laos. that China would not like to have it identified. Also, right? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, it's I, you know, in in you know uh, the. It, it, you know, there there are a number of scientists who have have published research where they they are arguing that um, that this was a spillover that happened at the Huanan market mm-hmm. in in uh, in Wuhan. Like that's not a that in itself is hardly a great look for China. Like like how, you know, and and there has been good reporting showing that they really, you know, um, that they had really let. Uh, you know the wildlife trade and the trade and the fur trade just just go crazy and um and and so that's that's a that's a bad thing and 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 that's definitely something that you know needs to be uh, uh looked at going forward because that's that's an easy way yeah. to get the next pandemic no i think they're very embarrassed about the the wildlife market that's their that they're not interested in a lab leak. They know that that's not an issue. I think the the market is an embarrassment because look what happened to the world as a consequence, right? Right. So they so you hear they 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 will often like float theories that it started it in the United States yes. at a lab here <laughs> that it's spread by frozen food into China. It's not us, you know. Yeah. So and then the the nor- regular people on the street can't pick out the nuances. They can't say whether that makes sense or not because they have no way of of looking at it. And that's why these things perpetuate. I get people asking me all the time, why isn't this possible, right? So it's really frustrating, but um, I'm I'm afraid it's not going to be sorted out. Are you writing a pandemic book? Have you planned to write one? Um, I, I, I am working on a book, but I'm, it's going to be, it's going to take a while for me to get to the point where I'm like ready to, mm. to talk about it. I'm sort of in the sort of the crazy writing as fast as I can stage, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's really been actually very interesting to sort of see, kind of, um, mm-hmm. the, the develop, the sort of the publishing evolution, you know, as, as publishing reckons with the pandemic, and we're starting to get books coming out, and yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you know, some are 
good sort of first passes of history and, you know, and, it, and some are like looking at the politics and they're interesting. Some are looking at the science. I, I suspect that like, you know, there will be great books on the pandemic that won't be coming out for like another 10 years, you know, because mm-hmm. it's just, yeah. there's just so much data and so many dimensions of it to write yeah, about. It's sure. so, such a big subject. There will always be a market. So there are some people who want to capitalize and get in early and some will wait and have a different, but they'll all be interesting because people, just like 1918, people still talk about the 1918 pandemic. They do, they do. But what's interesting is that, um, you know, uh, uh, when, um, you know, sort of literature professors have gone back mm. and looked at sort of what was kind of the culture, cultural response to the great, uh, to the 1918 flu. And not much, like in a, in a, in a way, like people are trying to like not talk about it afterwards. You know, the, the, it's a, there's almost sort of a studious kind of ignoring of it. You see some stories that, that do sort of touch on, on feelings of, of, um, you know, of, of mortality and solitude, but they're never really like, you know, there's no like novel about what it was like to be in the 1918 flu. Nobody wrote about that. It wasn't, it wasn't until much later, you know, you know, like, you know, John Barry's book on, on, on the flu was like, that was decades later. Yeah. 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 Which seems to me a good account of how, how people felt, right? Yeah, but you had to sort of you had to have enough distance to look back at it and be like, yeah, "Wow, that sure. was a big deal." And and we, we you know, let's try to like reconstruct what happened and what it was like for people. But at, there's surprisingly little at the time. Even when you look at the newspapers, it's just it's like people kind of go on with their lives. Yeah, yeah. I I spoke with John, Jeff Taubenberger not mm-hmm. too long ago, who you must know, right? Sure. And he said the 1918 influenza is the ancestor of all the inf- human influenza viruses we have had since. Well, the seasonal or the pandemics all start with uh, 1918. Isn't that interesting? It's, yeah, that's fascinating. Fascinating because there were certainly influenza viruses before, but for some reason that one stuck. <clears throat> so my last question is, uh, is taken from uh, journalists, right? Whenever I talk to a journalist, they always say at the end, is there anything I asked you that I... Sh- I didn't ask you that I should have. So, <laughs> um, no, I, I think we've covered a lot. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, no, it's it's uh, it's been a, it's it's a lot. There's a lot to talk about, but uh, no, I feel like we we definitely okay, covered the bases. All right, so that is a special twiv uh, with Carl Zimmer. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twiv. You can send questions or comments to twiv at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work, please consider supporting us. We're a nonprofit, so you get a tax deduction in the U.S. And you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute to make your de- uh, donations. There's a variety of ways you can do that. You can even send us a check here at the incubator. We get checks now and then, so feel free to do that. My guest today, uh, science writer Carl Zimmer. Thanks for stopping by and thanks for chatting. appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology, the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>